My name is Ron Carrico and I am with the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Today is April the 10th, 2017, and uh, we're with uh, Al, Al Deegan. Al Deegan, spelled D-E-G-E-N. Correct. And we're his home in Palma Valley, California. And he's going to tell us his uh, military aviation history. So, well, a little let, me, bit. Let, me, let me ask a question. Let me start. First of all, where were you born? I was born in... In Chicago, in in, uh, in the suburb of Chicago, which one? Well, not actually a suburb. It was. I'm trying to think right now of the um, the area. Oh, well, it was just. It was Rogers Park. Rogers Park. And it was just right a part of Chicago. I mean, it was not a suburb. It was a part of Chicago, and uh, uh, that's where I was born. 1923, September one. My memory is only so good at this point. <laughs> now, I wanted to say the reason that I joined the Naval Air Corps was that I had a friend named Skip Wincoop, Walker Wincoop, and uh, that was of the... Skip Wincoop was a guy that loved flying, and he loved the water, and he loved everything about the Navy. So he got excited about the war and this this 1942, and he wanted to be a naval aviator. So he talked to friends of his, Al Deegan and Dean Clark, into going down to the Naval Air Corps enlistment uh, station and volunteering to go into the Naval Air Corps. Okay, so your pilot training class was. When did you start? I started in 1943, but the point, the, the, the thing I wanted to get across was that Skip Wincoop talked the two of us, Dean Clark and Al Deegan, into going down and joining the Navy Air Corps. And when we got there, he got so excited about getting into the Air Corps <laughs> that his heart went berserk. Oh, oh no! I mean, it, it, it beat many too many times, and he kept going back and, and retesting while we were there, and uh, they just wouldn't qualify him. So both Dean Clark and I were accepted because we didn't care. <laughs> we were just down there with him. Yeah. I mean, neither of us had a big love of love affair going with the Navy or anything or the Air Corps, but we went along, and so we were accepted and became so part where, of it. So where did you go to pilot training? At, well, I started... Well, I started into the cadet program, and uh, we we started in um, in Indiana at Greencastle, Indiana, which was the DePaul University. So, which airplane did you fly first? Well, I didn't fly then. I just it was, they started out with the program. One of the problems that I had going into the Navy was that they took in a whole bunch of people. And then they discovered that their attrition rate was not what they thought it would be, so they started to slow the program down. Mm. So we started with in Greencastle, Indiana, at DePaul University, and spent 90 days there just doing classwork and and doing uh, physical training and so forth. So so you flew probably three different airplanes in pilot training. I flew three different. Well, I I started with the Piper Cub actually. Okay, and then what? Yeah. And then to the N2S Stearman. Stearman, yeah. Oh, well, that was a fun airplane to fly. Yeah, well, it was interesting. And I got a picture here of someplace. Right there. Right here. Right. So I flew the Stearman. Then it went to the Volte Vibrator, the SNV. Or, you've never heard of that plane? No, of course I sure, have. Sure. Have you really? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I didn't think. Anybody. And then the SNJ. Well, so they had, oh yeah, okay, so the SNJ, so... Yeah. Yeah. So I flew... T-6? I flew four, four different planes. Okay, great. And so when did you graduate? Graduated in July of 1944. Oh, for, well, July 44, okay, so then your next airplane was to the Dauntless. A SBD Douglas Dauntless. Where did you train? And I trained in, in, um, uh, in Florida, in Pensacola. Okay, how long was that training? Well, I I can't tell you exactly because I was wasn't specific in in timing, but I uh, we trained for well, I guess it would be four or five months 
and the SBD. Okay, so now let me just, let me back up. Your friend that you actually got into the Navy with, did he make it as a pilot? He made it as a pilot, but he went to twin engine. We, okay. we, I went single engine, he went twin engine. Okay. And uh, So uh, what did he end up flying? He, he ended up, he ended up, what did he end up flying? Yeah. He ended up flying the uh, the twin engine. I'm trying to think what the plane was. There's not that many. There's a C-45. The was it a beach? No, no. Or was it a beach? Beechcraft. Yeah, it was a beechcraft. Beechcraft. Probably a C-45, perhaps twin engine transport. Yeah, I kind of lost touch with him because he went a separate route yeah, yeah. in the training than I did. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I flew the. I actually, I, 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 I checked out. A, I had a twin engine checkout in the beach. The bamboo bomber. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that was, was a, uh, the A11, wasn't it? Uh, C45, I think it was. Yeah, C45. But yeah. but it was before the C45 uh, went with the uh, metal uh, frame. The previous one, I think it was the A11 or A12. Well, I don't know whether it's metal or not. Yeah. All I know is they. Yes. Yeah. All well, I know is that when you pull on the runway, if you didn't get it just right, the guy said, you'd, well, as soon as you get it pointed straight, you cop power to both <laughs> of them. And he said, but on, on the other hand, my last student said, "Yeah, I did that, and last all I did was go off the runway faster." <laughs> <laughs> well, I can remember flying the the uh, S. No, it wasn't SNV. It was it was a twin engine, the B twenty six converted to the Navy. Oh, cool! And they clipped five inch five feet off the wings or something, supposedly, so that when we took off in the plane, and I was co-pilot, I wasn't, I, I, I didn't get to be uh, qualified to be a primary pilot, but if you didn't hold the throttles and the pitch absolutely in full bore to take off, you didn't make it. If, if anything failed on the way from leaving the ground, you, you lost it. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about the SBD. Since we have one in the museum, um, you know where you got that one, right? No, I don't. It came out of Lake Michigan. And then, oh, I think we told you that. And Lake, and I qualified on Lake Michigan. Really? On it, the, it might have been, well, it wasn't an old plane of mine because I didn't lose one, but... Well, they had the Wolverine and the Sable were the two different carriers there. And I think I was on the Wolverine. Well, tell me about that. What was it like? Did you actually stay on it? Did, no, did not stay on it. Uh, just took off from Glenview and flew into the into the area and made a couple landings and took off again. You take off a, a full stop landing or or rested landing? A rested landing in the on the cables. On a solo or with an instructor? Or? Solo. Really? Wow. So where was it in relationship to Chicago? Well, you know, I can't honestly tell you that, but it wasn't that far away. I don't yeah. think. I mean. Uh, I'm I I can't my memory is not good enough to go back and well Lake Michigan is pretty darn big it's big it, it was well, yes but it, it was it was generally north of Chicago okay so you took a lot of Glenview then you fly up and uh, they might I, they say there's over 130 airplanes still in there in the lake I can I can I can believe it because we would lose well the first thing that we learned about it was that the planes that we were flying in, and, and the one particular one that I had at least, had been stripped of, of, met, met, of, uh, of all the uh, protection, the, the metal plates and so forth that protected the pilot. Sure, the armor. And, mm -hmm. and so the, the plane was, the, with the engine that it, that it had in it, the uh, the inches of mercury that we would would have on it would be much less than when we were flying them because right. they probably weighed, you know, four or five hundred pounds less. And so we we had a big problem of overspeeding, of, of coming in too hot. What kind of approach speed would you have? Do you remember that? What kind of what? Approach speed would you have? Gosh, I, I can't remember specifically. The, the tendency was to come in hot. Right. And we wanted to come in at a, at a slightly increased angle and slow down for the carrier landings. Now, the SBD has dive flaps on it. Yes, it did. Are there different flaps than the dive flaps for landing purposes? Absolutely. Okay, I've never really noticed I, that. I haven't either. I haven't well, either. 
I can tell you that one time when when I was out in the Pacific in Hawaii, uh, that I was flying an SBD, uh, pardon me, SB2C. Oh boy, you flew that one too. Huh? SB2C, and we were, I was doing a test, uh, some kind of a test on it, that it had been damaged or something, and they repaired it, and I was flying, and um, a a army pilot made a run at us, you know, a mock run. So I said, we'll, we'll, we'll fix that guy. So I pulled the plane up and, and, and blew on the, the uh, dive brakes to slow the plane down, let him fly by, and then I would drop, I was going <laughs> to close the dive brakes and pick up his tail and give him a little hoot. Uh, and so, but the problem was when I, when I put the dive brakes on, it slowed the plane down so much I was up, I went into a spin. <laughs> wow. wow. And, uh, and well, and then I just, you, I gave it the normal spin recovery, snap, the, you know, Rudder. direction and, yeah. and full stick forward and full throttle. Well, no, not the first time and then the second. But anyway, the plane wasn't coming out of the spin because the dive brakes were open and it wouldn't pick up enough speed to recover. Right, right, right. And so I finally realized it and closed the dive brakes and came out probably 500 feet above the ground going rather quickly and uh, I said to my gunner in the back that was a little close and, it, and he said <laughs> he said he said well I was out of the plane ready to bail out <laughs> I can imagine yeah <laughs> so okay now so where did you train to fly oh you, tra you trained to fly the SBD in Pensacola yes and the thing I always learned but I always learned about that uh, actually, I got up and at the one in the museum, it used to be on the floor. And I got up and I looked in it, and it's got that telescope. Okay? Or, I, well, actually, it turns out it's a three power telescope, I find that out. Did you have that in there? And Not was, that I remember. They got rid of that, I think. I, that didn't, I, didn't, I don't recall seeing it. But you had a gun sight of some sort or another, correct? Well, we, yes, we had just a basic gun sight. Okay, now. So let's let's. But we didn't, you know, we we didn't plan to machine gun anybody with. This plane was too slow to. There's just, two thirty calibers on the front of it. Yeah, and thirty calibers in the back. Right. You know how many missions you flew? Well, I didn't. Combat actually, missions, huh? Combat missions. How what? How many combat missions? Oh, I didn't fly any. I never got into combat. Oh no. <laughs> well, I'm good, I guess. Well, I. I just didn't didn't make it. Uh, we got, I got uh, in Air Group Two, of us, joined Air Group Two, and then they discovered they had too many pilots, and they and they transferred us, and I went to a utility squadron. Okay, well let's let's back, let's back up a second here. Let's let's try keep it chronograph chronological. So you you graduate from pilot training in July '44. Yes. The war ends in uh, basically one year later. So, then when you trained in the SBD, you must have graduated somewhere around the first of the year? Or finished, uh, finished your training SBD somewhere? Yeah, that's about right. And how did you, then where did you go? Then I joined Air Group 2, and, and, uh, you know... Were they on a, was that a carrier then, or? That would, well, it was, it was an air group, they weren't assigned to a carrier yet. Okay, so where did you join the group? I I joined them in Pens as I remember in Pensacola, Tokyo Bay when they signed the armistice. Wow, wow. So you didn't fly you didn't fly at Okinawa or any of those kind of a, those kind of missions. No, I didn't. I didn't get into combat. Okay, well, the whole SBD flight thing is interesting to me, and the reason. And the, the reason why is because of the tactics. I mean, you obviously were familiar with the tactics. Yes. When you're going to bomb a ship, and I'm sure you must have dropped bombs on something out. Yes, there. we did. We practiced. So, when you actually you're flying, in, let's say, what would you say, five to six thousand feet above sea level? Yes, at least. And then when you roll in, you're doing you're you're going you're, you start your dive at what about a hundred knots or so? Oh, more than a hundred knots. Okay. Probably I mean, you start just starting, just starting. We we. we 
Well, you would just be flying along a normal flight, 120 knots, I'd there you say. Go. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, how did you start the dive? Well, we just pushed over. And, you pushed over, okay. And, uh, and, and <laughs> just. How, how did you know where to push over? Oh, we just flew along, and there would be targets on the ground right. that, that we would bomb, and uh, we'd just push over and, and aim. And of course, you were you were going down like this, and you would be going, even though we felt like we were going sure. 180 degrees down, we were, the lift would be carrying us on a slight angle. So maybe we're diving at like 50 to 60 degrees. Okay. And w- of course, we would, we we're supposed to pull out at about 1,500 square, 1,500 feet. And but sometimes we would just stay right on the target. Sometimes a little longer, and end up at 500 feet or something, and come out fairly close. And a pulling out at five Gs or so. Yeah, well, I'd say five to six Gs. Yeah. Okay. Did you ever forget to put the dive flaps out? Uh, I don't think so, but I can't. I can't remember that. Well, I've talked to I've talked to two different SBD pilots, uh, Jerry Coleman. Uh-huh. Who you know was the radio announcer for the Padres for forty years? Okay. Now you did. Did you know I, he? I didn't know him. Did you know he flew SBDs? No, I did not know that. Yeah, how about that. Now he flew SBDs and he got over there in four. He was a Marine pilot, um, and he ended up flying off of a place called Green Island. That's where he did most of his flying. And he came back and they were he was getting checked out in the SB two C, and the war ended, and he was. He was out of there, you know. Well, that's what I, that's sort of. I was out of there after the war was over. Bang! Quick, but we went. We were flying SBDs, and we were in Pasco, Washington, as I remember. And they just brought in a bunch of SP two Cs, and there was no, there was no uh, training or anything else. You just got into the SP two C and flew it. I mean, well, it, it wasn't that much different, but. It was not near as reliable as the SBD was. Yeah. What was the nickname? The nickname of the SB2C? Uh, the Hell Diver. No, son of a bitch, second class. Oh, well, <laughs> oh, I, I don't remember that. But <laughs> That's good. I mean, that's good. I, heard, I heard that before. Yeah, people hated it. Son probably. of a bitch, second <laughs> class. Yeah. Well, it was uh, not a very reliable, it was heavier and. Uh, <clears throat> It, it wasn't as reliable a plane yeah. as the SBD was. Well, they they flew the SBD a long time, and I mean, heck, it won the Battle of Midway. You know, when it really comes oh, yeah. right. down to it. You know, it and a, Jerry said it was very, very stable. A very good plane. Yeah, very good plane. But what I was always curious about is, I mean, when I flew fighters, the way there was a couple of different ways to enter your dive. One was just to kind of slowly go in this way or pull the nose up. I guess you could do that. Though. Well, I think yeah. In actuality, we would we would go like this and. Go down like that. I mean, may make a slight turn and go down because we just didn't go like yeah, this. You don't want to. Not an English No. No, we we'd be flying along and then go into a dive like that. And then that. usually just following a guy in front of you, sort of thing. You'd fly on his wing. Yes. You you didn't want to get in in a slipstream if you. Were you flying uh, flights of four usually? Four plane formation. Yes. So. Um, after training, so you and you probably didn't end up with an awful lot of time in the SBD when it was said and came down to it. Probably, well, my total time in in uh, was about a thousand hours. Oh, that's a lot. That's yeah. not very much. Well, <laughs> well, no, not. Pardon me. My total time from the f- beginning of my flying until I left the air f- air corps was oh. about a thousand okay. hours, yeah. including. Uh, including F4Us, because I went back after the war in in uh, in 1949, I would say 48, 49, someplace in there, and joined the the Navy Air Corps squadron in New Orleans, and to become a uh, a member of the thing because we could get better booze. Uh, the price was right on booze. Price was right on cigarettes, and uh, and we you know filled a certain desire, I guess, to fly a little more. And uh, okay, so let's 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 go back. So 
We talk about the SVD. Well, you always had. A, did you always have the same? We always crewed with the same guy, the same gunner in back. I had the same gunner. What was his name? Pat. Um, it's in my in my book there. Pat Carroll. Where was he from? Pat Carroll was from New York. Did you ever see him again? No. That was it. Huh? That was it. That was it. Yeah, it's, I, I figure he pay, he probably had had enough of me, and I and he, the, the times we got in so many close calls. And it's a close call. Tell me about a close call. Well, but, see, besides the spin when you were attacked by the army oh, pilot. Oh yeah, but that spin and well, and then I got into another time. One time when I I got into another spin, and uh, almost didn't get out in time, but had enough experience to recover from those situations. He's pushing on the rudder pedal, by the way. Yeah. Get the stick forward and I've, ta I've, the rudder. I've talked to an awful lot of, um, you know, Navy pilots, and one of the guys, uh, uh, Diz Laird, who lives over in Coronado, he was, just, he was a Hellcat pilot. Okay, I flew those. Really? Well, anyway, he got in, He was talking about air combat, and he was in a dogfight with a with a Japanese Tony. Oh boy! And so he rolls in this way, and the Tony, and they kept going up and down and up and down. And then pretty soon he was he was he was talking. He was doing this, and I said, "What are you doing with your foot?" He said, "Oh, whatever the guns jammed up above the rudder pedal was a solenoid. You had to punch the solenoid." <laughs> yeah. And so he was just reliving it. You know, <laughs> right then. Uh, well, let's talk now. So, how in the world did you end up in Japan for the armistice? Or not, they didn't even call it the armistice, did they? Well, you know, because our carrier group went there. Which carrier were you we on? Well, at that time, and you know, I was trying to think back, and, and it, it was the Munda Bay, which was a, a, a little carrier. A little carrier. Yeah, I landed on those for a couple times, and uh, uh, made two night landings on the Saratoga in Hawaii, and that was about as thrilling as anything I've ever done. Have you ever made a night landing on a carrier? I, I purposely avoided the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Just for that reason, by well, the way. Well, <laughs> it, it is beyond scary because actually we were, uh, we were catapulted off and the night was so dark that you couldn't see anything. So we would, as soon as we were airborne, we would slide, start a slight gradual turn to the, to, to the left, to the, to the port, and come around and, at, at altitude, and there was no way to identify the carrier where it was, and they would give us a, a, a signal on the, on the uh, radio to start our turn to come into the, to the carrier, and as we got downstream from the carrier we could pick up the wake because of the phosphorescence right and and then come in and then of course picked up the LSO who was lit up with his suit and uh, that's an experience I just don't want to ever go through again we made two night carrier landings one guy made two and crashed both times but walked away and he was qualified they said <laughs> yeah, yeah, they needed to think you there. Yeah, I, I, well, it, it was it was exciting to say the least. Uh, so no, well, so the surrender was signed on September two, nineteen forty five. Yes, okay, uh, approximately. At, uh, and where were you? I was in the Tokyo Bay for the signing of the uh, of the armistice. What was going on overhead? I don't remember exactly. I mean, it was nothing. Nothing was going on overhead. I well, think. the reason why is, is I and I've seen pictures and I and I've read that they actually the Army Air Corps and the Navy flew four hundred airplanes overhead, just to kind of make the point to the Japanese. Well, we're really it, serious it, about this. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I, w I would never say no because I I can't remember. So then you sailed home, I guess. I sailed home, and and. Uh, Became a salesperson for Lord Baltimore Press and and. Um, oh no! Wait, let's, let's talk about sailing home. So, uh, you must have left within a 
Did you did you go ashore at all in Japan with the war? Yeah. Oh yes, I went ashore for uh, at least three or four times, and we carried a sidearm when we went ashore because there were rumors, and I don't know whether it actually was true or not, but that they that the Japan if you wore your wings, and it said don't wear your wings. Really? So we took our wings off, and uh, they said that they imagined that these were the same pilots that were bombing them and killing their people, and so they grabbed a couple of, supposedly grabbed a, a one or two uh, uh, aviators or guys that were accompanying aviators and strung them up in the back alleys. Really? I never heard that. Well, it's one of those rumors that we don't know was uh, true or yeah, not, yeah. but we believed it well enough to not wear our wings yeah. and to carry sidearms with us. Right. And we would escort a uh, uh, usually 10 or 15 or 20 uh, enlisted men. What was it? What was it like ashore? Was it pretty well bombed out, wasn't it? It would. Oh well, you would walk. I remember distinctly walking up to one building which looked just fine. I mean, it was brick and mortar, and and then you went inside it, and it was just a hollow shell. Yeah. It had yeah. been bombed out completely. And did, were the people? Did the people stick around you, or did they well the, vanish quickly? The kids, kids followed us. Right. And we would have 10 to 20 kids wanting whatever food we had because we carry our own food and dispense little bits of food, candy to the kids and so forth. And uh, they liked it. And the people probably were scared to death of us, but... Yeah, well, so you, were, you would have been a, an ensign at that point? I was an ensign, yeah. I, I, I made Lieutenant J.G. later. Yeah, I had a. Where were you when the war ended? Where were you when the? Well, war? I was in Tokyo Bay, and uh, well, it, we were just one of many, many, many ships, and and we knew that there were signing the armistice on, on, a big ship that was nearby, but we didn't know specifically what was going on. And as far as the when the atomic bomb was set off, did you? Where were you when that happened? Now that I was in in. Transit. I mean, I was on on the ocean in on a uh, a carrier, a uh, uh, CVE, and uh, we just heard about the bomb. I mean, I didn't didn't know anything specifically about it, yeah. other than the fact that it was a, a game changer. Yeah, and then you probably knew about the second one a couple of days later. And we flew over them. And we flew over of it. But I think that the bombs, I mean, there's a lot of argument about whether the bomb should have been dropped or not, and I'm all for it because it saved, uh, you know, a million Americans or, and, and a million or two million Japanese. The, More than likely, yeah. More than likely. I, they, I mean, it would have been just, they were prepared to fight to the, to the last man. So they did everywhere else. And... Uh, and woman, and kid. I, mm -hmm. when I was on shore in Tokyo, I went into a tea room and met a young Japanese guy who was 19 at the time, as I remember, and he he was a member of a kamikaze squadron. And I said, well, you know, how come you volunteered for that or something to that effect? Because. He spoke some English, and we we kind of understood each other through words and through uh, motions and so forth. And uh, he said, uh, "We we didn't volunteer. The squadron commander volunteered the whole squadron to become kamikazes, and uh, that was it." And he 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 got out of it alive, obviously, and. Uh, was was happy to do it. How did you meet him? We, I don't. We went into a went into a, a tea room, and I, you know, I don't remember the specifics, but I saw him sitting there, I guess, and I went up to him and said something, and it developed that he was a pilot. He'd had, and I, I was amazed at his hours because he had like three hundred hours, 
and you know we we kind of hear where they're they got 42 hours right. or something right, right. and uh, he had experience and uh, he, he survived and it was it was quite amazing to me that, yeah 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 and so anyway we and and then I went back and and, and got a bunch of little uh, trophies from or not trophies but gifts from various Japanese people and uh, I lo lost most of them on the carrier they were they were stolen from me yeah, yeah. As, as how long did it take you to get home did you come home straight from uh, to California or to go to Hawaii or we came, we came home and ended up in in uh, California and then flew back to to uh, Chicago took your your airplane, your SVD. No, plane. no. I mean, we didn't take that. We we were given transportation of some kind. Right. Air, right. And um, that part of my return trip is all vague to me. Well, probably you're so happy to get the heck out. I. Oh, well, that's all we wanted to do was get back home and get released. And when did you? So when were you actually out? In, when did you were you released? In September. Well, actually, I. I went to Northwestern University, got back in Northwestern University, and joined the the uh, fall semester. Oh, really? And uh, of 1945. I thought there was a whole deal where you had to depend on the number of points and so forth and so on. To... Well, I we got out right away because uh, we were qual. In other words, if you were a lowly ranked ensign. You got out quicker than somebody that had experience. Oh, I see. And I we, see. we got out real quick. So you went to Northwestern? I went to Northwestern. And when did you graduate? And graduated in 1948. Uh, and then is that when you joined the, I guess, Naval Reserve is what you and then, then I went and, and then I went to, to uh, a three-month, I went with Life Magazine to to um, their temporary programs, which they had had you soliciting retail people to allow you to put signs in the window, advertised in life, so forth, mm. and we were promoting that. And uh, I did that for like six months, and then and then uh, went down to got a job into for the New Orleans item. I was a, a salesperson. For the New Orleans item, and then now, the uh, the main paper was the Times Picayune down there, and and uh, the item was bought by uh, a, a guy who was a former Navy pilot once, and uh, he he hired me to be a salesperson down there, and so and then when I was going around, I I discovered that the reserves. The Navy reserves were looking for people, and so I went in to, to uh, join the reserves. And the guy said, "Well, we you can fly. What we've got is two planes. You can be the TVM or the F for you." And I said, "I don't oh, think." Oh boy! And I said, <laughs> "I said, well, I'm not strong enough to fly the TVM." <laughs> <laughs> oh my! You yeah. got a horse that goddamn plane around, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I. Transition into F four U's. So what was that like? I loved the F four U. I, that was the greatest plane I ever flew. It it stuck to the deck, which is what I liked. We we had come out of the SP two C, which had shock absorbers, that when you hit the deck, it just took it wanted to take off again, and the F four U just squatted down and and was, and uh, had there was no no transition. I mean, you went. I hadn't flown for couple years and then they gave me a couple hours in the SNJ and then into the F4U and you're off. Came, it came right back to you? Well, it, it had to or else you're dead. <laughs> well, I mean, you get twice as much horsepower and yeah, oh at my. least. It was, but it was just a great plane. Well, the one thing, it had a needle nose, it had a long nose and for a short guy like me, you have a tendency to to stand on the left rudder as you're coming around in the groove, and so you would skid in the groove, and uh, always got in trouble with that. You, you had to try to stay off the left rudder. 
Well, how did you? So you did make carrier landings. In so there. I did. I I did, uh, I I joined the and got into the F for you, and our squadron was was training, and we did various. What kind of what was the training? What kind of training for air to ground or air just, to air or just air to air and shooting a few um, uh, targets and and uh, the flag or the dart yeah, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, I do remember one time because these few things stick in your mind. I was flying in a diamond formation, guy up on top, two wingmen, and a tail guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the tail situation, and I'm flying along. And what you're doing is just positioning yourself between the two planes, and not paying as much attention to what's going on around you because you're just depending on your your fellow mates. And I looked up my head, and there is a a, a pier. We're flying down the shoreline, and there is a pier right at eye level. I mean, I'm going to take out the pier in another fraction of a second and I just pulled it right up through the thing and and gave the leader the hell because I said you were trying to kill me but you weren't successful. <laughs> well so so now in those days so you were flying with the reserves but you must have had another job. I, well yes I was I was working for the New Orleans item as a salesperson and selling advertising Okay. And uh, and so, how much did you fly then? Once a month? Or I twice a month? I flew. We we flew um, every other weekend, basically, as I recall. And uh, I flew the FG F FG and uh, the FG. I was, what's that? What's the FG? Well, that's F for you. The, oh, okay. uh, the F for you was made by Vought Chance, right. and the G was Goodyear. I think it was the same plane, just manufactured by a right, different. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. And um, so would, you, you must have done some gunnery with that airplane. I did some gunnery and with it. It had did it have fifty calibers or twenty cal yeah, twenty it, millimeters? It had it had fifty calibers and twenty millimeters, and fired both of them. Did you fire them at the same time? Well, no. If you had twenty millimeters in, it didn't have the fifties, right, okay. and vice versa. So did it have six or did it have eight? As I recall, it had six and two twenties. Uh, I mean, pardon me, two twenties in each wing. So when you in a now, if you're doing a strafe pass, you're at about ten or fifteen degrees. When you fired all the guns at once, someone told me you would lose about twenty knots. The thing would slow down. You could feel it. You could feel it slow down. Wow. Ab absolutely, that is a is a straight fact, and yeah. the plane just. Put a shock absorber on it is what you did. Did you do dive bomb in that airplane too? Yes. And how'd you do the dive bomb in that airplane? Put the wheels down. Whoa, get out. The wheels the wheels served as dive brakes. No kidding. Yeah. Same maneuver. The same wheels. same maneuver come come off to the right or yeah. yeah, kind of a wing over. Well try to keep your We target. didn't dive bomb as much in them, but we that was an alternative thing. Sure. But Generally speaking, when when they went into Korea, which is what they did later, they were support for the Marines, right. and because uh, we had jets at the time, and these were ground support for the Marines, and and uh, I can remember one time coming back from a from a, a, a an attempt, a, what should I say, a practice mission, and the, one of the uh, Guy said to the squadron commander, "He said, well, uh, we're going to have to see how many Marines you killed.' And he, he we said, well, what do you mean? We were, we were machine gunning right where we were supposed to.' He said, no, you were supposed to be behind this one and you were in front of it. And uh, we didn't kill anybody. <laughs> yeah, Jerry, yeah, well, Jerry Coleman talked about it. He hated that, the Corsair. He really didn't like it at all. And the reason why, he, well, for a couple of reasons, but he said it was really unstable. It was not as, as steady as, a, as an SPD. In well, way. it wasn't quite as steady, but it was pretty darn steady. I mean, the SPD was like a rock. Yeah. But then he also said one tried to kill him one time. He said he, he his engine quit on takeoff in Korea, um, and then he jettisoned the bombs. And he thought one of the bombs hit the tail wheel and flipped it upside down. 
So he was upside down and backwards going down the, <laughs> the runway. Wow. And when he pulled him out, of course, he was a nervous wreck, and they put him right back on the airplane the next day. He said he got so he got so he would he would just he was shaking so bad when he got the airplane they just sent him home. What happened to me was when I, after I was in New Orleans, and I by the, my job I they folded up the newspaper when I, uh, towards the end of my career. And Somebody didn't sell enough papers. That's all. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. So. So I transferred back, I mean, I went back to, to Chicago and joined the Lord Baltimore Press, which was made folding boxes. And two weeks before I left, we had gone aboard a carrier and were qualified fully to be, in, to be effective as, as uh, um, ready to fly. And, and uh, so then I... I transferred to Chicago and applied to Glenview to get back into the program and they said they didn't have any openings at the moment. And I said, okay. Now Korea hit about two or three weeks later and uh, they called me up and said, we're ready for you now. And, and, and I remember saying, well, he's not here now, but when he comes in, I'll... <laughs> I'll let you know. I'll tell him that you called. <laughs> and then I sat back and waited. Yeah, yeah. And because I had a, a wife and a child and I was employed, and I, I came within a fraction of going. Yeah, yeah. Corsairs. Cors fine Corsairs. And I love the Corsair. I, I, I don't know, something about that plane that just... And just the one we have... In the museum, we got from. Uh, was it in the lake? Where was it? Uh, oh no, no, no! It, was it in the ocean? No, no. It's uh, it was it's history. I believe it was a Tunisian airplane. Mm -hmm. and, Tunisia. Uh, yeah, they flew it out of Tunisia for a long time. I mean, it, yeah, probably went through several different. Yeah. Uh, and then it ended up in a in a collection. Um, was it a five? Did it have the the? They had they had various. Developments and and finally they got a, a a panoramic cockpit panel that went all the way that came halfway around you. It's it's a later model. I know that it was a, it maybe has, a four a five five model probably. I don't know, but I know the one thing is I maybe you can answer this. The early models had a had a uh, I guess a tendency to get into spins at low altitude. Yes, and so they did something to one of the wings. Put a spoiler on it. Which wing was it? I can't tell We you. can't. CO and I were looking for it. We were trying to find out where the spoiler was. And we looked all over and we couldn't identify anything. We well, could. it was, as I remember, it was a V-shaped right. thing Which that was on prop? one wing. Which way did the prop spin? Would, would it go clockwise or counterclockwise? I remember? think it was clockwise. clockwise. It was right on side. the right wing, so you, you're I, getting I, a, I wouldn't bet my life yeah. on it. Well, we couldn't find it, because I... Wing. Hmm. It's, was it in towards the back of the wing, or the front of the wing, or the middle of the wing? Or? I'm, I'm thinking it was inboard more. Yeah. It wasn't... How big? <laughs> we're going we're, we're gonna to look on Wednesday. Yeah, we're going to look. We're gonna well, look. it was, you know, maybe this, maybe this wide or something, and... I, I do remember, I, I'll try to answer your question, I'd say something uh, approaching 280. Wow, yeah, that's what I've heard too, yeah. Now, when we got the SB2Cs, we started flying them, right, and, and they just brought them in and, and landed them, and then we got in and started flying them. And then later on, a week or two later, representatives came down and started telling us about the characteristics of the SB2C and, and one of the things that I remember was we should not dive it over 400 knots Ooh, well. or maybe it was 370, 380, something in there and, and we all said well we've been diving them at 30 and 40 and 50 knots over your maximum speed. 
we just did it and got away with it. Well, the first, I mean, I, I remember when I was, um, you know, graduate from college, I went to F4s and then went out to um, the gunnery range and flew 45 degree dive, and I'm in the back seat going, Jesus Christ, this is scary. Yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, the job of the back seater in that point was just to crawl up altitudes. Yeah. So it was like, sure. And it's 12, 11, 10, I got ready to pull. You know, it was that fast, you know. Really? And, oh and yeah, it was fast. Th that's what the guy used to, uh, our, my Pat Carroll used to say, you know, pull out, pull out. Well, it was, you, you know, <coughs> 2,000, 1,500, 1,000, pull out. And then it, it got more panicky, pull out, pull out. <laughs> <laughs> because we'd get down there, well, you would get target fixation, if you ever heard of that, oh, maybe, yeah, oh, yeah. where you would, you would see it and you'd say, well, if I could just go another whatever distance was, I could get this thing perfect. And uh, see the tr the trouble is is that we lost when you're, some looking, pilots that when you're way. looking at the when you're looking at the gun sight, there's a thing called a pipper, right? Right. Because you're actually traversing across the ground this way in the dive, you're not going you I guess you could go straight down, but it's almost No, you can't you you're you're going this way. You're, you're, the, the so plane, the, because so you're, you're got, getting a lift in the dive. You yeah. got the, lift in the airplane. Yeah, right. And so the pipper kinda of is going across the ground. Yeah. And so if this is your target here, you kinda of watch the pipper till you get to that point. The trouble is is if you're shallow if you're supposed to be at 60 degrees and you're only at 55, you're shallow, and the pipper hits, you're going to be short. Right. And if, or if you're too fast, it's going to go long. Right. So that's why. You have to <laughs> so once you got away from airplanes, did you ever fly again? No. No. So well, you didn't buy a private airplane, a, no, a never, Piper or a, no, a uh, well, Cessna or, or Beach. Well, they were expensive, but I, I sort of adopted the attitude that I got out of this alive. <laughs> And I, why I shouldn't tempt fate anymore wow. because I did enough dumb things when I was young that I almost got killed. That if I start doing it again, I'm going to just repeat one of those things and kill myself. And so, I had a family, and sure, that's interesting. So one of the questions now, you're you're ninety something, right? Ninety three, almost ninety four. Okay. So one of the questions I always have is why you know how people get to be that old. And what I found was that most guys that were your age either never smoked or didn't smoke very much. I didn't. I smoked very little. And then I, when I was about 35 to 40, I said, why don't I quit once? Because I keep, keep saying I don't smoke. I smoke half a pack a day maybe or something like that. Yeah. And, and, and I said, uh, I'll just see if I can quit. And I stopped. And I never looked back. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a. That's, and I drink moderately. Yeah. I. Where did you finally end up? I mean, obviously you were very successful in your your business. Well, I, I, I was a salesperson, and, and, uh, left the company. Well, the company was absorbed by International Paper, and I didn't like what was going on. So I went out, and had a couple jobs, and finally ended up working for Potlatch Corporation. They had several plants that they had um, absorbed because the the plants bought paper paperboard from them and couldn't afford it, and they ended up owning the paperboard converting plants. So we went to work for one converting plant, and it was a it was in terrible shape and losing money like mad. Anyway, we turned it around and made it uh, profitable. And then the comp the potlatch decided to get out of the business, and we bought the company, mm. and uh, we're successful and sold it. Mm, good. What, let me let's talk about aviation. I always ask one question that I forgot to ask right at the beginning. I'm beginning to run out of time, though. Okay. But I, I'm I'm not not pushing you real fast, must but. We've been at this for an hour and a half now. What's about all you know? Well, I, I, one thing I forgot. What did your parents do? My well, my parents was an advertising executive, and flew in World War One. Really? I have his logbook here. What did he fly? He, he well, I. Here, let me take a look. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we take some pictures? I'll You're taking pictures. pictures constantly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I have, I have another little camera here. To Jenny. Was he flying to Jenny? Yeah, flew. 
I think if we had one, maybe they had wooden props in those oh, days. Sure, yeah. Well, by the time the war was over, I flew everything that the Navy had at one time or another. Yeah. PBYs, uh, JM, which was which was the B twenty six. Yeah. Uh, the float planes. I don't know. I guess it's sort of like if you fly one of them, you can you fly, fly them all. Yeah. 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 It, it's not much. Yeah. Wow. What pictures do you want to take? Uh, wow, this is really cool. Reinfield, he was here in San Diego. He was at Reinfield. Uh huh. Aerial Gunners, Memory Sprawl. Boy, wasn't it cool how people had such good writing those years? <laughs> So that, I guess he didn't get in combat either, did he? No, he didn't. Boy, you guys were lucky. <laughs> we were very fortunate. And it's probably a good field, I mean, probably a good, well, we flew at Rockwell Field. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. January 4th, 1919. But my son never flew an airplane. I was going to ask you. <laughs> yeah, I, I met your son, I played golf with your son. Question. Sure. What's, what was your favorite aviation story you'd love to tell? Oh my gracious. You must have one. Come on, well, it's late at night at the bar and everybody's bragging. It's well, I, I, it's difficult for me. To, I'm, there were so many little ones that chances, chances that I took. I mean, like, I can remember one guy who jumped out of an, jumped out of an SP2C and uh, opened his parachute and he was drifting down and I was uh, I flew flew around because we were in the in the, in Hawaii and it was over um, Molokai I think and so I circled around him and and uh, to, to be able to tell where he landed in case anything went went wrong and uh, later he told me he said well thanks a lot for circling around me and I said well I was just trying to get he said you collapsed my chute at least once <laughs> <laughs> I said oh Jesus <laughs> his backseater must have jumped out too then I guess I beg pardon I guess his backseater must have jumped out yeah, too yeah well no he, he didn't have a guy in the backseat oh, at that okay. time but uh, you know there were there were other stories of things that happened I uh, that was that was one of them I can remember, and 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 the the one of of going down, of having the dive brakes on and and uh, closing and uh, not almost not playing out of the spin. That was yeah another one. I heard I heard stories where some of the F, later in the war when it really got hot, you know they didn't you know like Guadalcanal and the SBDs were. Dive bombing. They said, "Heck, I'm not. I flaps out. I'm just get in and get out and drop your bomb and go." Yes. So, wow. Well, anyway, let's turn this thing off. Okay. That Thanks a be... lot. That was great.